have tonight a word on use giving thanks as a weapon in spiritual warfare. And I was given this topic, I was like, well, that's uh, quite the unusual topic, but I'll definitely take that one. I, I can't remember, I didn't even like listen to what she said after that, I was all over it, <laughs> right? As soon as she was like, yeah, yeah, that's the one. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. So, um, you know, took me a little while, a little bit of research, but you know, I've come up with some scripture for us to read through. John chapter 11, verse 33 through 44, if you want to follow along or just listen. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. You notice, you know, it's a little odd. You know, Jesus is angry. You know, the, the story before that is uh, Lazarus has died and his sisters are, are crying and everyone's mourning. And, uh, you know, it says Jesus is angry. And, you know, a lot of people are like, well, what's going on there, right? Is he angry at them? You know, have they shown like a lack of faith or something? Or is he, you know, but in my personal opinion, Jesus is preparing, is stirring up his spirit because he's about to take on an enemy, right? And uh, the, it's, it is written, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Amen? And uh, I believe that... Uh, He's stirring himself up for a battle with death here, and uh, he's not angry at the people who are mourning their brother and, and you know, displaying pretty nat natural, you know, concern for their fallen brother. Anyways, continuing. Where have you put him, he asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. The people were standing nearby. See how much he loved him. But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across the entrance. So yes, I believe that this act of, is an act of kingdom warfare from the kingdom of darkness, or sorry, the kingdom of God against the kingdom of darkness. And so Jesus says, roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he's been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up at heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it, <laughs> but I said it out loud for the people standing here that they will believe you sent me. Giving thanks to God is a high level of trust or faith in God. If you uh, are just hoping God will do something, it's, it's a little bit more down here, right? If you're like, well, you know, life's really rough right now, but I hope God comes through. You know, I really hope something happens. Or, you know, you're, you're demonstrating some trust in God, but to, to give thanks, especially in the middle of like a catastrophe or a family death or your life falling apart, really shows a very high level of trust and faith in God. You're... Um, when you give thanks, it comes with the attitude of expectation. You don't give genuine thanks unless you believe that you have received. And so, when you give thanks in spiritual warfare, you're exercising a high level of faith. You can stand before God in the middle of whatever crisis you're going through and be like, I thank you, Father that I am an overcomer in Jesus Christ. You know, in Jesus' name, I thank you, you know, that you paid for healing, even though you might be in the hospital and everybody else is, you know, crying and weeping and wailing and wondering what's going on, and you, you, you speak to God and you say, I thank you. You know, healing was paid for. By his stripes, I was healed in Jesus' name, right? It, it takes a lot of guts to do that, but to do that, it's, it's exercising a, a high level of faith that you won't see in common... <laughs> Verse 43. What's that? John 11. Verse 33 to 44. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out! And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a headcloth. Jesus told them, Unwrap him and let him go. Jesus came to set the captives free. Lazarus was bound hand and foot by death, just as he was bound by his grave clothes. 
I was doing a bit of research on that actually, and it, it appears from my research that they would pretty much wrap you up almost like an Egyptian mummy when they buried the Jewish people, right? And so for him to stand up when wrapped up like that was probably a miracle in itself. Like, it doesn't say what happened to him, but I have a feeling that, you know, he was brought up, like raised from the dead, not just stood up on his own and scratched his way up off the floor or the tomb and walked out, but he literally raised up and comes out, right? <laughs> so in the same sense, is there some habit or some hang up or some hurt that you have in your life? You know, is it binding you hand and foot? Let us all give thanks to God, and if you would like, you can repeat after me. I thank you, Father, that you, that you have delivered us from death. I thank you that you have given us your spirit, and it dwells in us. I thank you that you have given us life, and that more abundantly. I thank you that as we follow after your kingdom and your righteousness, we have provision for all our needs. I thank you that we have the pleasure to be numbered amongst such fine brothers and sisters. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. And I also hear that there's a hurricane coming in the States right now, too. Was it Hurricane Nate? You know, named after Nate here? Yeah, yeah so. <laughs> I would like all of us to pray that that hurricane, you know, that, that we have. Well, I'm going to pray that it stops, actually. That it just kind of breaks up and it's over here, right? So, you know, maybe Nate will come help me out here. You know, if, you know, you got authority over this thing. You know, it's trying to take your name, right? You know, so. Father, I thank you that in the beginning there was dominion given to men, women, over this earth in Jesus' name. And we've been reconciled to you in Jesus' name by the blood of Christ. And that we've been made clean and we can stand before you. We can come boldly into your throne and make requests and petitions. So this day I pray in Jesus' name that this hurricane and this hurricane season that is afflicting people in the south and the states, that this stops in Jesus' name, and that un unnecessary loss of life is put to end. And I pray that people come together and work together and help each other in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Father, for your provision, for healing, and for freedom in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you, Ray. Appreciate that. <laughs> Apparently, Bernice isn't going to be able to make it tonight, so you have to get stuck with me. <laughs> All right, Elroy, you're on deck here. <laughs> Elroy's going to has an offering basket, and I want you to take one thing out of it. Everybody, take one. All right, everybody, take one. <laughs> I'll just wait till you've got it. And no, they're not to throw at me because you didn't like my message, okay? <laughs> yeah, it's not tomatoes. It's not tomatoes. <laughs> hey, I wouldn't want to waste throwing a tomato, man. I'd want to eat it. Oh, Elroy, I better get one. <laughs> Hey, I get to pick the one I want this time. Okay, good. All right, I want you to inspect that rock. Look at it, feel it, lick it if you want. I got them off the parking lot in Oliver, so, you know, they've traveled a few miles, kilometers. But it looks a little bit different than the guys beside you. I want you to really look at yours, and then I want you to trade with your neighbor, if there's somebody sitting beside you or in front of you or somebody, trade with it and just kind of check out the other rock, okay? And I can guarantee I spent hundreds of hours making sure that no two rocks were exactly the same here. I made sure of that, okay? 
But what has a rock got to do with thanksgiving? Well, it's not really about the rock. It's about people. Thanksgiving is really about people because we spend time with people. But we need to give thanks for people. We're all different, just like all these rocks. Every, every rock is different. Your, the rock your neighbor had was different. Um, there was one la lady in Oliver. She's a missionary from Africa. She goes every, over so, every so often, and uh, she reached in and pulled out a rock, and it turned out it was the shape of a map of Africa. She was thrilled with it. I think she kept the rock. So, I mean, maybe that was a God sign for her. I'm not sure. But I didn't specifically pick that rock out of the thinking, oh, there's one that looks like Africa. I didn't do that. Nate had one that looked like Alberta. <laughs> but he had said, I don't know the significance of Alberta. So, But uh, anyway, we're all different. Every one of us is different. Now, when we looked at the rocks, we just looked on the outside. Now, if we look around the room, you know, we're all different. Some are tall, some are short, some are wider, some are thinner, some have gray hair, some have no hair. No. <laughs> some have it cut short, whatever. Okay, we're all different. And that's just on the outside. But what about on the inside? Those of you that have taken the strengths test and you find out, like I know Ray, one of his strengths, he's a learner. That's why he can teach the Word of God so well, because he's a learner. He's absorbing it, really absorbing it, and taking it into his spirit, right? Mine, I'm Mr. Consistency, okay, and adaptability. Those are two of mine, but that's what makes me unique on the inside. It's just the way I am. And uh, Pastor Mark, he's Mr. Positivity. Like, no matter what happens, he's going to see the bright side of absolutely everything, the world can be crashing down around him, and he's, you know, hey, we're moving ahead. So that's who he is. That's what, what makes him who he is. That makes him, and why, why does the church need him? Well, we need him. We need somebody positive when we go through a hard time, you know? There have been times when, when I've gone through a hard time, and I needed that encouragement. I know um, when my uh, father-in-law... Uh, passed away, Pastor Mark came to the hospital just to sit with me, just to be there. He didn't have to say anything. What, what, I didn't expect a word of, you know, a great word of, oh, well, you know, positive or anything like that. Just his presence there was positive for me and encouraged me. It tells me, wow, my pastor cares about me. It's good. We need one another. And because we need one another, we need to be sure to be thankful for one another. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote most of the New Testament. And I'm going to read you nine different verses from different books that he wrote in the New Testament. And listen to what he says. He's giving thanks. He's either speaking to an individual or to a group of people in each of these instances. In Romans chapter 1, verse 8, he says, I thank God through Jesus for every one of you. 1 Corinthians 1, 4 to 6 says, Every time I think of you, and I think of you often, I thank God for your lives of free and open access to God given by Jesus. He's thanking God for these people. Ephesians 1, 15 and 16. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for Christians everywhere, I've never stopped thanking God for you. Philippians 1, 1. Every time you cross my mind, I break out in exclamations of thanks to God. He's thanking God for people. Colossians 1.3, our prayers for you are always spilling over into thanksgivings. 1 Thessalonians 1.2, every time we think of you, we thank God for you. 2 Thessalonians 1.3, you need to know, friends, 
that thanking God over and over for you is not only a pleasure, it's a must. We have to do it. In other words, he just felt compelled. There was something inside his spirit that just compelled him to give thanks to God for the people there, for the people that were part of the church, moving the church forward. 2 Timothy 1.3, every time I say your name in prayer, which is practically all the time, I thank God for you, the God I worship with my whole life in the tradition of my ancestors. And then in Philemon, verse 4 says, Every time your name comes up in my prayers, I say, Oh, thank you, God. Now, how often do we thank God for one another? We need one another. We all need one another. Now, what makes us important? Like, obviously, to Paul, people were important. But why are we important? What, what makes us so special that we're really important? Well, God made us in the first place. God made us. He made you. He made me. He made your neighbors. He made the guy down the street from you. He made, you know, the police officers, the firemen, the ambulance people, the people that work in the grocery store. He made all of them. They may not recognize that, but he made them. And because he made them, they're important. Everyone is important. Now, if we go back to Genesis chapter 2, you know, God's made man, and man's gone through naming all the animals on the face of the earth and all this, but there was something missing for man. He needed somebody to relate to, not just God. So God took one of Adam's ribs and made woman. So there was a fellow human being that Adam could relate with. And you and I relate to one another as people. God knew that we needed to be in a form of community of some kind. Now, there are families. That's a community. There's our church. That's a community. There's our campus in Oliver. That's another community. Yet together, we're a larger community. There are other churches in Penticton here. They're part of the, the they're individual communities, but they're part of the local community of the church in Penticton. There's a community of different clubs, like service clubs, like Kinsmen or, um, uh, yeah, all, all the different clubs. I mean, in Oliver, they have a real active group that my mother-in-law is part of, of quilters. They relate to one another. They have something in common. They relate to one another. We have something in common. We relate to one another. And because you live in Penticton, you relate to people in Penticton. Grocery shopping, going to get gas, going to see the doctor, the dentist, whatever. You're relating to fellow human beings. We need relationship. We're not a bunch of islands that are separated from one another. God never intended us to be that way. We're to relate to one another. We're made for that. Unfortunately, sometimes things happen and, you know, in families and they get broken up or whatever, but that still does not negate the fact that we re need to relate one to another. Okay? We need one another. Um, it's interesting. Um, I got a call from someone and I went and saw them yesterday. It's the person that bought Pastor Elroy's house in Oliver. And that gentleman is quite sick. And he has cancer and they've told him it's terminal or whatever. But he is so thankful for Pastor Elroy coming and visiting him and leading him to Christ. He, he tells me, yeah, Elroy's a great guy. I really like him. Well, there's somebody that Elroy's reached out to and drawn him into the kingdom of God. And he understands that he's part of a bigger community. Because he, he likes to relate to Elroy. Elroy comes and visits him every so often or phones him or whatever. And he, he appreciates that. And he even told me, be sure you say hi to Elroy for me. So hi from Don. You know, so we need one another. We need to relate to one another. Now, 
some of you have probably, you know, uh, how, has anybody here already celebrated Thanksgiving? Are you going to do it? To, you, some have. That's great. You know, you're with family or friends or whatever. Uh, I'll be with family tomorrow, relating to my brother-in-laws, my sister-in-laws, my mother-in-law, and in whatever nieces and nephews are able to make it. But we're part of community. We need one another. God put us in families because we need one another. God places us in cities. God places us in groups. God places us in different churches because we need one another. And he wants us to use what gifts we have. Now, I don't have the same gift and talent as Dan or Ray or Melanie or Michelle. They have unique giftings and talents that I need. I need them. For me to be a complete person, I need them somehow in my life. Some people to more or lesser degrees. Like, I need Nate in my life, okay? To, okay, one of the things, like this morning, my wife did the sound system in Oliver for uh, worship, and then Nate came back there, and he took over, right? My wife needed Nate to take over so she could go downstairs with the kids, okay? And now Nate's doing it here. We got Oakley in the back on the camera, well, we need Oakley, okay? We need Elroy. We need Nolan. We need, we need uh, one another all the time. We need Nick at the back ushering and just making sure everything's under control back there. We need one another. We're not islands, and we need to be grateful for one another. That's how God made us. Now, what else makes us important? Well, God wanted us to be able to have a relationship with him. Now, he's a holy God, and according to Scripture, we're sinners. In other words, we're not holy. But the only way for that which is unholy to approach the holy is if there's some kind of sacrifice, which was established in the Old Testament. So what God did is he sent Jesus, his son, to this earth as a sacrifice so that we could come into relationship with a holy God. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody on the face of the earth, because Jesus paid that sacrifice for us, is automatically in relationship with God. The only way you get that relationship is if you receive it and say, yes, thank you for Jesus. Dying on that cross for me so that I don't have to die there so that I can have relationship with Jesus, or with our Heavenly Father, right? That's, that's what it's all about, to have relationship with our Heavenly Father. So we have relationship one with another, and then we have personal, individual relationship with God, and we also have a corporate relationship to God. But that's important. We need that for us to truly survive and accomplish what God wants us to accomplish, we have to have that kind of relationship.